let's stand. Let's sing that old song, All Hail King Jesus. to be in God's house today. Glad you've come to share in this service. Small group meets tomorrow evening, Wednesday evening. Seven o'clock will be Bible study. There will be no prom practice this Wednesday. Today is the last day to order an Easter lily if you would like to do that. The forms are out on the table in the foyer. And if you were nominated uh, for a church office, those nomination forms you need to get back in. Annual church elections will be August the August. <laughs> That's what it says. I didn't know he ever made a mistake. Thank God he can use the imperfect people. That way you and I have hope. We can call that April the 27th rather than August the 27th. We'll be a few months behind if we wait for them. Good Friday service, April the 18th at 7 o'clock. I hope you will make plans to come and be a part of that service. We'll have a wonderful time on Good Friday. And then the Easter Sunday is two weeks from today. So keep those things in mind. Always good to be in God's house. Our numbers are down a little bit this morning. God's word says, where two or three are gathered in his name, Amen. that he would come and meet with them. Amen. Well, I believe this morning if we will open our hearts and our minds to what he has for us, he will be here in a very special way. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence at the beginning of this service, we just pause to tell you that we love you. And we thank you this morning, Lord, for your many blessings. And as we've entered this Easter season, Heavenly Father, I pray that each one of us, afresh and anew in our hearts, would consider what this time of the year truly means in the life of the Christian. That you left the portals of heaven to come down here and be one of us, live a perfect life, and then die on Calvary's cross. And then on that third day, praise your wonderful name. 
that you arose from the grave, Heavenly Father. And because of that, we have a hope that is beyond anyone else's hope. We have our hope in you. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just come and minister in this service this morning. Touch lives and at the point of their need that they might feel and sense your presence. Bless in this time that we spend together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor. If you haven't taken the basic Bible study, you know there's a scripture verse with each lesson to learn. And the first one is Revelation 3.20. And you know most of us learned it in King James. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. So Jesus it seems to be saying to us, come and die. And that's a good old song that we're going to sing, come and die. You ready? Oh, I need to cleanse it. 
sing this song sitting down, can you? No. Stand with me as we sing Standing on the Promises. You have the joy down deep in your soul. Somebody back here did. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> let's do that little chorus, Sprite's chorus, Yes, Lord, Yes. You remember that one? Yeah. I'll yes. say Yes, Lord, Yes. Yeah. I'll say Yes, Lord, Yes. To your will and
burden, I want you to feel free to come. But let's sing the spirit of the living God. Fall fresh on me. Father in heaven, once again, as we come into your presence, what a joy it is to know, as George said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there you are at the very best. And Lord, today we come to you as your children, and I know that probably each one of us has something that's on our mind, something that we need a miracle to take place in our lives. We just thank you, Lord, for the fact that we still live in a country where we can worship in a church, where we can lift up the name of Jesus. But, oh, my, we're seeing so many changes going against that very precept in America. And somehow I pray that you'd wake us up. I pray for our leadership, Lord, that you would wake them up. And they start with our president, down through the Congress, the state, county, and city leaders. Lord, I pray for the Church of the Nazarene and all of our six general superintendents and all the other leaders. I pray for Brother Russ and Sister Gail that you continue to bless them as they lead our district. Pray that you'd have your hand on Gail that the healing would just continue to come. Father, we are rejoicing to know that Andy Casey was able to go home and he's recuperating and we just lift him up to you. Pray that you continue to touch and bring strength back to his body. Now, Lord, we also want to lift up little Blake Casey to you right here in Little Rock, David's boy. And we just pray, Father, that your hand would be upon him. He's having such a terrible problem with an upper respiratory. And, Lord, we pray that you just touch him in a special way. When they're that small, they can't tell you what's wrong. But, Lord, I pray that you give the doctor special guidance and wisdom and just touch this precious little baby and bring health back to him, I pray. Father, we think of our senior adults that would be here if they could. We thank Lord and Claire. We pray that you continue to touch her and Maggie and Lucy. We pray for these ladies. And then, Lord, I pray for Kathy Blue, who lost her aunt this last Friday. And I pray, Lord, that, that you would be close to her and the rest of the family. Lord, uh, it just seems like we're living in a day and age to where there's a lot of bad things that are happening to good people. And, of course, we know that that's all prophetic, that it's going to happen that way. But, Lord, I just pray today in a special way that you would remind us that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Sometimes when the enemy attacks us, it almost seems like a great tsunami wave that's going to overwhelm us. The Lord, remind us that with you at our side, there's nothing that can touch us. And, Father, I think of the many dads and moms and grandmas and grandpas that are here today that have unsaved children, unsaved grandchildren. And Lord, if ever there was a day that we need to fulfill the Great Commission, it's today. And I 
pray, Lord, that you'd give dads and moms and grandmas and grandpas a burden for their lost children and grandchildren. And help us to pray for them as we've never prayed. And help us to talk to them. Give us the words to say. Because we believe that Jesus is coming soon and we want to be ready. Just bless us. Be close to us, I pray. And Father, I want to pray especially for these that have come to the altar. You know exactly what's going on in their lives. And I just pray that you would minister. I thank Father of Sam's brother-in-law, Tom, and his two sisters that you just touch them and be close to them in a special way. Minister to them, Lord, and let them just sit your presence. And Lord, we're thankful to know that they have a personal relationship with you. We pray that you just continue to be real and close to them. And Lord, there's so many times when it just seems like things are almost overwhelming, but we know that really they're not as long as we keep you in the very center of our lives. Bless our servicemen and women across the country and across the world. Be close to them. And I pray, Father, that you would bless us as a church. Lord, there's so many empty seats here, and there are many faces that we know who should be here that chose not to be here today. And we pray, Lord, for those. I pray, Father, that you would just put a burden on us to send us your love. And Lord, help us to never judge anybody, but help us to just love people in the church and into God and into heaven. And Father, we thank you for what you have done, what you're doing, and what you're going to be doing. And as we pray each Sunday now, we ask that you'd walk around our altar and up and down each pew. And would you give each one of us that big daddy's hug that we need. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for us. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen.
know you have blessed us before and will bless us in the future. In Jesus' name we pray. There was a group of professionals that asked a group of 48-year-olds this question. What does love mean? What does love mean? Here are some of the answers that they gave. Rebecca, age 8, said, when my, when my grandma got arthritis and couldn't bend over to paint her toenails anymore, my grandfather did it for her all the time. Even when his hands got arthritis and ed, that's love. Billy, age four, said, when somebody loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. Carl, age five, said, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they just walk around smelling each other. <laughs> and Chrissy, age six, said, love is when you go out to eat and you give somebody most of your french fries and you don't ask for any of theirs. And Danny, age seven, said, love is for my mommy who makes my daddy a cup of coffee, and before she gives it to him, she takes a sip of it to make, it so, make sure it's okay. And final one, author and speaker Leo Boscaglia once talked about a contest that he was asked to judge. And the purpose of the contest was to find the most caring child. And the winner was a four-year-old boy whose next-door neighbor was an elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife. Upon seeing the old man cry, the little boy went into his neighbor's yard, walked up on the porch, and just sat in his lap. Mm -hmm. Isn't love great? Mm -hmm. Isn't love great? Mm -hmm. And this month in April, as we come on the Easter season, we come to Good Friday and we see what love really is. For God so loved us that he gave his one and only begotten Son. And Paul said in Romans 5 that God commended his love toward us in the while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. The title of the sermon this morning is On to Jerusalem. If you'd like to fill in the blanks, here's the first one. This is about the parable of a returning king. A returning king. Now Jesus gives this parable about a man of noble descent. He was speaking about himself. Jesus Christ. He became a man just as it was decided at the very beginning of everything that he would become a man, come to the earth and die in our place. And he was of noble birth, not only by the word noble as what it signifies, but when he became a man, he became a descendant of the kings of Judah and a son of David. And the parable goes on, this illustrious person went to a far country and by which he's talking about heaven so-called not just because of its distances so far away from us, but also because we can't see into heaven. Sometimes I think, wouldn't it be great if we could see into heaven? Wouldn't it be wonderful? And this man gave ten of his servants, one translation says he gave him ten pieces of silver, another says ten silver coins, another one says ten minus, to invest and earn while he was away. Well, he felt that he could be gone with confidence, and these servants, because of their loyalty to him, would invest this money and make a profit for him. And I think what he's referring to here is really not so much money, he's referring to his disciples. And while he was gone, they would be turning the world upside down, and didn't they do that? But you know that also goes down to you and I. We are his disciples also, and we're to be turning the world upside down. But sad to say, in America, especially America, we have become a very apathetic Christian, haven't we? Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to offend somebody, so we just don't do any of those kinds of things. Isn't it amazing how we have just about thrown Jesus out of everything? You remember back around Christmas time, there was a school in part of the Los Angeles district where a, it was a six-year-old boy had some candy canes and he had a little story of how it came about, and he was passing out notes to his kids. And the teacher saw what was going on, and she said, you can't bring Jesus into the school. And she collected all those little pieces of paper that gave the little story about it. She said, now you can give the candy out if you want to. In something. Remember what Jesus said to the Jews when they crucified him? 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. They didn't have a clue. We're there today, aren't we? We don't have a clue what it's all about. Sad to say. Well, he gave these men, these men 10 minus. And whatever, whether the money part of it's really all that important in the story, I don't know. But whatever it was, he gave them this money, and they were to make an investment, a profit on it. Now, that's to say, you're to make a profit on your money. And while you are doing that, I will return. Do you understand what he's saying there? It's when you are supposedly working, fulfilling that great commission, while you're still working, he's going to return. And I kind of say it jokingly, but it still wouldn't surprise me if the rapture didn't take place on Sunday morning when it was raining, or there was a threat of rain. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be terrible if you missed the rapture because of that? But I kind of think when we least expect it, that's what's going to happen. So he's saying to us that we need to be fulfilling that great commission on a daily basis. For Jesus is going to come at the very minute that we don't expect he's going to come. We're living in a day and age, especially in America, where we've just about gotten rid of Jesus. He's not allowed to go anywhere anymore. He's gone. You remember the Columbine shooting? And we've talked about it. Ruth Graham, Billy's daughter, probably the greatest preacher of the family, she was interviewed by some news people, atheistic news people, and they said, well, where was God at this Columbine shooting? And she said, well, I'll tell you where he was. He wanted to be there, but he had been barred from the school. He couldn't be there. Right. Isn't that about true? Right. We just about barred him from everywhere. I'm amazed that they haven't yet taken the sacred oath, sacred oath away from us when you go to court. Put your hand on the Bible, you know. So many things are happening. But... The citizens of this country, now this man went to a far country to be made the king. But the citizens of his country, they hated him. And they sent a delegation out that said, we don't want this man to be our king. Now, this parable then is referring to the citizens of the country, the Jewish people, and especially the religious leaders of the Jewish people. Those were the very people who should have been looking for his return. He's coming with excitement instead of jealousy, instead of envy. So it's namely to these people that uh, this man's going to receive the kingdom. Now, they would be thinking he's referring to Roman Caesar, but in reality, he was referring to God the Father. And when these people were rejecting Jesus, what they were saying to God the Father is, no, we don't want him. We don't want Jesus as our king. This expression was meant to be one of utter contempt and unliking. They did not like him. They didn't want him. They said, we don't want this guy. Not only do we not want him to be our king, we don't even want him to be around us. Keep him away. Don't send him back to our country. But he was made king. And he did come back as their king. Unfortunately for the Jewish leaders, there was somebody that was calling the shots that was far above the authority that these religious Jews had. Now verse 15 tells us, And it happened that when he returned after receiving his kingdom, he said to the servants who had been given the silver that they should all come to him and make an accounting of what had happened. And I think this picture is referring to the time when Jesus comes back for the second coming after the rapture. And he's going to call for an accounting. And he's going to set up the Messianic kingdom for a thousand years. And he's going to be the king. Do you suppose that maybe this is what Paul meant when he said that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth. And folks, we are seeing in the news and we're seeing people running into people all the time and say, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe there is a God. I don't believe there is a heaven. I don't believe there is a hell. If there's a hell, we're living in it right now. Whatever they believe or whatever they think right now, you know what? It really doesn't matter what they think. Because there's coming a day, as Paul says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name. So you can say, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in all this baloney. You will one day. At the great white throne judgment, you will then. It will be too late then. Well, this was a parable that was also given to the disciples to prepare them for what was coming. You see, they still didn't yet understand the great plan of God that it was for Jesus to come to the earth to become a human being and to die. The disciples didn't get it. They still thought that he was the Lord, but they still thought that he was coming and he was going to set up that thousand-year Messianic kingdom and free them from the domination of the Roman government. And so not only was this a bitter pill for them to swallow, but also it was tough for them to even accept it in the first place. They just couldn't believe it. They could not believe that humanity would have the power to kill the Lord. Now you remember that when he first began to explain what was going to happen to, to him, later on he said, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised back to life. Well, the disciples didn't understand that. They didn't get it. In fact, we read that Peter, you know, he was the spokesman for the disciples. He was their leader. And I like to say that Peter, the only time he took his foot out of his mouth was to change feet. You remember? He was always getting himself in trouble. Peter grabbed Jesus, took him aside, and he began to rebuke him. And he said, never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Well, Jesus turned and looked at Peter and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter and the others simply couldn't get it. They didn't understand. They didn't realize that humanity would be able to destroy the Lord. They just didn't grab it. Jesus began his ascent to Jerusalem, next blank, because it was time. Because it was time. And one thing I've noticed in reading the Gospels, our Lord was always on time, wasn't he? Always on time, perfect time. In John 2, 4, when his mother asked him to help uh, in an embarrassing scene in a wedding because they ran out of wine, he said, dear woman, that's not my problem. And then he said, my time has not yet come. In John 7, 6, his brothers came to him and said, why don't you go to Judea and show your disciples the miracles that you're performing so they'll believe anymore. And he said, my time has not yet come. But now, in this passage of Scripture, we see that his time has finally come. Daniel's amazing prophecy in chapter 9, verse 25, was about to take place. The Messiah was coming to the earth. The Messiah was coming to Israel. And as Daniel said, the Messiah would be cut off. He would be killed. So the Messiah would arrive in Israel. He would arrive in Jerusalem. But he was going to be cut off. But I want you to note the scripture that Ron read this morning. Everything that, that Jesus said was going to happen, happened. When the disciples went in to prepare, they found a colt. Exactly where he said it was going to be. And the owners of that colt were there and they asked the same questions. Why do you need this? The master needs it. Just as Jesus had said it was going to be, God's great plan of redemption was right on schedule. It was right on time, wasn't it? Dr. William Culbertson said this. He said, Calvary was not God's afterthought. It was his forethought. It was planned in the very beginning. Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to die at just the right time at just the right time. The next blank, Jesus ascended to Jerusalem to fulfill the scripture. The scripture. Zechariah saw all of this centuries before it ever happened. Zechariah saw in verses, chapter 9, verse 9, he saw that the people would welcome him as he came into the city. He heard the shouts of praise that were going to fill the air. And he saw that he would be riding on an unbroken colt. Yes, Jesus came to Jerusalem to fulfill the scriptures. 
His birth in Bethlehem was prophesied in Micah 5.2. His virgin birth was prophesied in Isaiah 7.14. His rejection by men was prophesied in Isaiah 53.3. He was despised and rejected by mankind. Every time I read that verse, this thought goes through my mind. This is the Creator. This is the second person of the Trinity. This is God. And the people despised Him and forsook Him. They hated Him. I think I'd have probably zapped Him, wouldn't you? But He didn't. It just boggles my mind. But yet I think again, isn't history repeating itself? We're doing the same thing. We are rejecting the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. We're rejecting him. We don't want him. I didn't catch what school system it was, but Friday on the news I heard history would not be taught in this particular school if Jesus' name was mentioned. Help us. My goodness. If Jesus' name is mentioned, then we're not going to teach history. Isn't that what it's all about? I like to think of this as history, his story, in my word. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. And then his substitutionary death was also prophesied in Isaiah 53, 5, and 6. Those verses read, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds are we healed. He did it all for me. He did it all for you. Very rarely will someone die for a righteous man. But Christ died for sinners, the worst of men. Then verses 41 through 44 that Ron read to us, Jesus ascended to Jerusalem to die for sinners. That's the next blank. He came to Jerusalem to die for sinners. It was the love of Jesus that brought him to the earth. It was the love of Jesus that brought him to Jerusalem. And he knew that his arrival would motivate his enemies. Their thinking was there is absolutely no way this uneducated rabbi is going to supplant the power and authority that we have. No way. And he knew that he would quickly be led to the cross. And his enemies would very quickly prove their superiority over this uneducated rabbi. And yet still he came to die. Still he did. Still he completed what he had to do. And we can see his compassion for those who would crucify him. He looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. He mourned for their coming sorrows. And he wept because they had missed their time. They simply didn't have a clue as to what was about to happen due to their jealousy, their deceit, and their misunderstanding. And so the people missed their day of visitation. And they killed the Messiah. And you know I've heard some preachers on TV say, well the Jews didn't kill Jesus. They did. They didn't actually do the physical thing, but they're the one that did it. In fact, they wanted him dead so much that they placed a generational curse upon themselves and upon their children. They told Pilate in Matthew 27, 25, let his blood be on us and on our children. Folks, that's a generational curse that's been handed down all these years. And that's why the nation of Israel has had so many problems and why there's so many people that hate the Jewish nation. But they didn't understand. They didn't get it. They didn't have a clue. And Jesus knew that when he was nailed to the cross after he had been arrested, falsely convicted, whipped until the blood flowed down his body, a crown of thorn jammed down his head. He carried a cross beam that was so heavy, probably about 120 pounds through the streets of Jerusalem, and the loss of blood was so bad he collapsed. 
and a man named Simon, Simon carried that to Golgotha for him. And then they laid him down on the top of that cross beam, put a nail right here into the wood, put a nail right here, put his feet together, and put a big nail through that. And then as they raised that big cross up, the pain was so bad, he cried out. And I can't help but think there must have been tears. He was in such a mess, blood coursing throughout his body. And then having to listen to these people cursing him and saying, if you're really the son of God, free yourself. And even the other two that were crucified said, if you're really Jesus, pull yourself down and pull us down too. He was all alone, all deserted. No one cared. No one was there. And the people didn't have a clue. You know why I know they didn't have a clue? Because of what Christ said as he looked down on them and he looked up toward God and he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. But folks, I want you to know that Zechariah tells us there is a day coming very soon that the Jews are going to realize what they did. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10 through 14. Let me read these to you. Jesus says, they will look on me, the one that they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. And on that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadel Rimmon in the plain of Megiddo. And the land will mourn each class for itself with their wives by themselves, the clan of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives, the clan of the house of Levi and their wives, the clan of Shimel and their wives, and all the rest of the clans and their wives. What will they be saying? We killed the Messiah. Can you imagine it when that realization hits? We killed the Messiah. That day is coming very soon. And their hearts are broken, Zechariah tells us. I read a story about a woman who went to see a psychologist and she said, I hate my husband and I want a divorce. But I want to hurt him. I want to hurt him so much. What should I do? And the psychologist looked at him and said, well, here's what you want. Here's what you need to do. Go home and just pour all kinds of compliments on your husband. Tell him how wonderful a husband he is. Tell him how much you love him and just do all kinds of special things for him. And then when he gets used to it, then divorce him. Then file for the divorce and divorce him. That, that'll get him. So she left and three months later she came back and the doctor said, well, how's things going? And she said, well, they're going great. She said, I did what you said. I followed the plan and things are just great. He said, good. Now's the time to file for divorce. And she looked at him in the horn and she said, divorce? Never. I love my husband. That's what Jesus did for us. Amen. All the things that were done to him, he still loved us. In spite of what we did, he still loved us. I heard a story not too long ago that uh, illustrates the fact that no matter what you and I do, it's not too bad that God can't get us out of it. God can get us out of any mess we create. Did you know that? There was a pastor that was beginning to take flying lessons. And all by his fourth lesson up in the air, the instructor said, I want you to put the plane in a steep dive and just go down. So he did it. And all of a sudden, the engine stalled. And he began to panic, and all he could see was the ground coming up at him so quick. And he thought, what in the world is going on? And the instructor just sat there. <coughs> and he realized the instructor wasn't going to help him. And so he said it, 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 it was just seconds, but it seemed like hours. My mind began to clear, and I realized what I needed to do. And so he said, I got the plane started back up, and I straightened it out. And when I straightened it out, I looked at the instructor, and I started to vent all my frustrations at him and chew him out. And he just smiled at me. And he said, I want you to understand something. There's nothing you can do to this plane that I can't get you out of. And he said, as I thought about that, he said, it seemed like God said the same thing to me. There's nothing you can do in your life, no matter how bad it is, that I can't get you out of it. Amen. And friends, I'd say that to you. There's nothing you can do that God can't take care of and fix. That's going to God me out. 
nothing you can do, no matter how bad it is, that he can't get you out of. And this pastor said, God simply said to me, if you will trust me and believe in me, I'm going to take care of you. And that's so true. Isn't it amazing how we worry about so many things? If we just put our total trust in God, there's nothing that you can do that he can't get you out of. That's the kind of God that we serve. Don't miss your greatest opportunity. I hope you all know Jesus. I imagine I'm probably speaking to the choir today, and that's okay. But one of the most important things I can say to you is that great commission. Therefore, go. We, we've got a lot of loved ones. We've got a lot of friends that are lost and are going to go to hell. If we don't make a difference, if we don't go. You know, sometimes we Christians kind of think, well, I don't really need to do anything. Uh, all I need to do is let my life be an example, and, and they'll just come running to Jesus. I don't think so. Doesn't work that way, does it? Therefore, go and make disciples. Therefore, go and make disciples. We've got to go. That G-O is an action verb. Go and tell people about Jesus. Well, what do I tell them? Tell them about what Jesus did for you. Tell them I changed your life. Make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. Understand that when you go to share your faith with somebody, you're never, ever by yourself. Jesus is right there with you. And he's going to help you. He's going to give you the backup. You always have the backup. And remember what John said, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So trust in him to get you through. And I want to encourage you. Talk to people about the end times. Well, what do you mean, preacher? Ask them this. Do you ever think about spiritual things? What do you mean? If you died tonight, where would you end up? Heaven or hell? Well, I hope heaven. If they say that, that means they're not ready. Would you like to know for sure where you can spend eternity? Well, yeah. First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just and he will forgive us and cleanse us from all righteousness. So all you have to do is confess your sins to him and believe that he's hearing you and believe that he will forgive you as he says he will in his word. Is God a liar? I've never had anybody in almost 26 years say they think God's a liar. No. So if you confess your sins, what will God do? He'll forgive me. And Paul said in Romans 10, 13, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be Amen. saved. So if you confess your sin, believe that he's forgiven, and then ask him to save you, he'll do it. Would you like to do that right now? And shake your head. Yeah. Grab their hand and pray that in sinner's prayer with them. And the angels will rejoice because there's a new one that's gotten saved. So, the old saying that I share with you all the time that was in my insurance business, that I used to have a paperweight, and I think I still have it, I've got to find it. It says this, if it is to be, it's up to me. Can you make it any simpler? Jesus is coming soon. I believe that, don't you? And I want, I've got, I've got some loved ones that I want to make to heaven. I have a nephew that uh, lives in the sand right now. Thinks it's okay. And his girl said, you know, we're going to go to hell. And he's the one that's been in church all his life. And she hasn't. But he doesn't have a clue. Everybody thinks, well, I'll make it up later. I'll get right later. You may not have a later. Do you have somebody that, that's like that, like my nephew, that's not ready? Talk to him. Pray for him. Talk to him. Ask the question, do you ever think about spiritual things? What do you mean? If you died tonight, where would you end up? Folks, time is short. You know, we used to sing the old missionary song, We'll Work Till Jesus Comes. We better get back into the work bag, don't we? Apathy is not going to cut it. Do you agree? Amen. Do you really agree? Amen. If I love you, do that's good. 
Do you agree? Yes. yes. Good. Good. We'll stand with you. Nancy Casey, would you close in prayer for us?